Welcome, my name is Harald Sack. And I am Mahsa Wafoi. And this is Knowledge Graphs, lecture number four, Ontologies as Key to Knowledge Representation. In this section of the lecture, we will give you a short, a brief recap of essential logics. And of course, we are doing this in a nutshell. So you should already know something about logic or after that lecture, you can recap it according to the references we have given you. And we shall start with Massa and propositional logic. Thank you. Yes, as mentioned, we are going to go over a recap of propositional logic. In propositional logic, the world mostly consists of facts and nothing else. These facts are also the so-called statements of assertions in propositional logic. Some examples for such assertions are following. If it rains, the road will get wet. This is already a deduction. If the moon is made out of green cheese, then cows can fly. If Oliver is in love, then he will be happy. Of course, all these examples are given in natural language, but propositional logic has the possibility to formalize these natural language statements in a way that they are machine understandable. So in propositional logic, the world consists of objects and properties that distinguish an object from another object. Between objects, we have relations. Some of these relations are unique, and that means they are functions. Okay, now let's see what we have in the syntax of propositional logic. First of all, in the syntax, we have a set of logical connectives. On the table on the right, you can see these logical connectives and their intentional meaning in natural language. In propositional logic, the logical connectives include negation, conjunction, disjunction, implication, and equivalence. Aside from the logical connectives, we also have a set of symbols. And of course, the set of symbols with the operators do not overlap with one another. We also have truth values in the syntax of propositional lo logic, which is a binary logic, true and false. OK, now let's look at how we can make propositional for formulas using the syntax in the PL. The Atomic formulas are all considered as propositions in propositional logic. That means all elements of theta, which is the set of symbols in the syntax, are propositions. If phi is a proposition, then also not phi is a proposition. If phi and psi are propositions, then also the conjunction, disjunction, equivalence, and implication between these two our propositions. There is also the concept of pro priority in propositional logic, which shows us which connectives are prior to which other ones. Negation is prior to conjunction, is prior to disjunction, is prior to implication, and is prior to equivalence. Okay, now let's look at some examples of how we can make use of propositional logic. In the table in the um, top part of this page, you can see three simple assertions. The first one, the moon is made of green cheese. Let's assume that in our modeling, this is the assertion G. We have the second assertion, it rains. We take R to be the modeled version of this sentence. The street is getting wet, and we call this one N. Okay, so now how can we make sense of it? If I say, if it rains, then the street will get wet. How do I model that? I easily combine the symbols with some of the logical connectives. And through this combination, I can say, if R, then N. OK, let's make this a bit more complicated. If it rains and the street does not get wet, then the moon is made of green cheese. I have this simple assertion in my table as well. So I can just say, if R, and not n, then g. Great. OK, and now how can we interpret the formulas that are created via the propositional um, logical connectives? It's as easy as mapping of all atomic propositions to one of the two truth values, true or false. Propositional logic is a binary logic, so an interpretation i in propositional logic is 
uh, the mapping of the for formula to one of these two truth values. So if f is a formula and i is an interpretation, then the interpretation i of f is a truth value which is computed from the f and i via truth tables. And you can see here a truth table for the different uh, values assigned to p and q. You must be familiar with this already, but just to give you an example, if the interpretation of p is false and the interpretation of q is false as well, then the interpretation of p and q is false. The interpretation of p implies q is true because we have two false atomic formulas. And the interpretation of the equivalence of p and q is true as well. OK, so when we write i entails f, or f is a semantic consequence of the interpretation i, this, and in case that the um, formula f is true under interpretation i, we call interpretation i a model of formula f. OK, so let me continue now how we do the model theoretic. Um, interpretation or semantics. I turn on the laser pointer so you know where we are. So if i now is a model of not phi, if and only if, exactly i is not a model of phi. So this is then the interpretation of the negation. Let's do the same thing for the conjunction. If i is a model of phi and psi, this is the case if and only if i is a model of phi as well as of psi. And in that sense, you continue in that way with also the disjunction, the implication, or the equivalence. And then you have stated all of the necessary rules of semantics. There are some basic concepts in propositional logic that come um, to use every now and then. One of these basic concepts is the concept of a tautology. We can say we have a tautology when a formula f is always true in under any interpretation i. In this case, we can also say all interpretation i's are models of formula f. Exactly. Let's continue. Look at the second one. In case there exists an interpretation that is true or is a model then for a specific formula, then we say this model is satisfiable. And in case there exists an interpretation i for formula f that holds to be false, then we can say interpretation i is refutable. And last but not least, if a formula is under all interpretation false, so there is no model for that, then this is unsatisfiable, then it becomes a contradiction. One other property that um, propositional logic has is decidability. In propositional logic, all true entailments can be found and all false entailments can be refuted as long as you spend enough time. This might take computational power, this might take too long, but there always exist terminating automatic theorem provers in propositional logic. And we have another very, very useful property. Just look at that here um, in the case. So if all of the um, formulas phi1 to phi n entail phi, if this holds or this holds, if and only if you have phi1 and phi2 and phi3 and 4n, so the conjunction of all of these formulas phi implies that phi is a tautology. And what we do here is we map exactly here the semantic entailment to a syntactic operation. The syntactic operation can easily be computed on a computer. And then exactly this property that here you connect the semantic entailment based on a syntactic entailment enables us also then to do these computations and calculations in an automated way. As well then here you see the decision if an assertion is a tautology can be made completely based on truth tables, so with a syntactic operation. And in principle, this equals the evaluation of all possible interpretations. And this also is what a reasoner for propositional logic usually does, so a pro computer program that tries then to find out 
whether you have a contradiction in your formulas or not, or whether a formula is satisfiable. This is exactly then what is done there and what is checked. Okay, so much for propositional logic. Propositional logic, as we have seen here, is on the one hand rather powerful, but not so much expressive. You saw that when we tried to model things like, for example, when it rains the streets will get wet, so this was a simple implication and of course the modeling was not very precise. To have more expressivity there is so-called first order logic, FOL. What is new in first order logic is that we introduce here two quantifiers. We have the existential quantifier and we have the universal quantifier. Existential quantifier says there exists something which then holds a specific condition and the universal versal quantifier says for all variables that I use here the following condition holds. Again we have all of the logical connectives as we have them in propositional logic and then we are dealing here in first order logic with variables so often they are here written in capital letters. We have constants so they might be true or false and these are named objects from the domain of discourse we are talking about and we have functions and functions can have a specific arity. And of course then we have relations or predicates and also they are connected to a specific arity. So here you see uh, a template or an example for uh, a first order logic formula which simply states then for all variables x there exists a variable y for which exactly here the predicate p of x holds or the predicate not q of and here we have a function of x and y and this then implies r of x. So this would be a more or less complicated formula in first order logics. In first order logic you can see some examples for the correct formulation of terms from variables, constants and functions in the first line. The f of x is for example a formulation of terms from a variable. The g of a and f of y is a more complicated formulation that combines constants with variables and functions. Correct formulations of atoms or atomic formulas from predicates with terms as arguments are also shown here. The p of f of x is one example of an atomic formula. The q of s of a and g of a and f of y is another more complicated and abstract example of an atomic formula. To get more concrete, let's look at the other example, greater than. Here, the location of the pixel and 128 are together given to the function greater than, to compare which one is greater than the other. This is also an atomic formula in first, first order logic. And putting all things together to come to composed formulas, we are using these atomic formulas, so the atoms, and connect them via operators and quantifiers. And you see here our example, which simply says, now I make an assumption about all pixels, and we say all pixels um, f uh, which have uh, here a given location, the location, location must be greater than 128, it follows that this pixel has to be a red pixel, whatever that means. So whenever you are then building these formulas, use brackets and be sure that you are in doubt whether you know what comes first. Use brackets to make clear you know, that um, you, you define really priority and sequence here based on the brackets. Another thing, of course, all of the variables that you are using, they should be quantified, which means they should be either it should hold for all or uh, there should an existential quantification for that. Now let's look at some examples of natural language sentences that are turned into first order logic with the use of quantifiers. In our first example, all kids love ice cream. We can formalize this sentence using the universal qu quantifier and a variable x. So we can say for all x's, if x is a child, then x loves ice cream. Isn't that a tautology? It is so. Now let's look at a more complicated example. The father of a person is its male parent. Here we have two different variables, x and y, and the universal quantifier. So for all variables x and y, if x is father of y, 
then this is equivalent to the um, proposition that x is male and x is the parent of y. Okay, let's continue with existential quantification. Let's say there are one or more interesting lectures, and of course we hope that our lecture, of course, is one of them. So I formalize this in the following way. So there exists an X for which it holds that lecture X and, so X is a lecture, and X is interesting. So quite clear, so there exists an X for which it holds that X is a lecture and X is interesting. Let's look at another one. So here we have the relation is neighbor, and we want to say that this relation is neighbor is symmetric. How do we do that and can formulate that based on first order logic? We have again a universal quantification. So for all variables x and y, it holds that if you know x is the neighbor of y, then it also holds that y is the neighbor of x, vice versa. So that is quite easy. So by looking exactly at these examples, you might have seen that, okay, this is a, a bit strange because in natural language, so we simply say, yeah, they're, they're all kids love ice cream. And on the other hand, we say something like, um, there are, there exists a lecture that is interesting. And you might wonder why in the upper case we are using the implication and in the lower case we are using the conjunction. Why can't I interchange this somehow? Natural language, of course, we know that it means the same if we formulate it in the same way. But if we really want to compute the outcome of it, if we look at the interpretations and truth tables, and we can do this on the next slide, we see that there is a difference. It's a significant difference. So let's look at the first example. All kids love ice cream. If we do this in the correct way, so for all x it holds that if x is a child, then x of course loves ice cream. Then we say here, it is possible that x is not a kid, but nevertheless loves ice cream. You see this for, if you look here, if this is zero, so if it's, x is not a kid, and um, if uh, x loves ice cream, then exactly this one computes to true. This simply follows because the implication, if you have here, let's say, a formula that computes to zero that is false, then you can, of course, deduce or imply everything from it. That's the uh, basic uh, thing of, of course, um, let's say, implication. The point is, of course, that besides children, there might also be other persons who love ice cream, and we don't want to exclude that here. So therefore, we are using the implication. If we would phrase it the other way around, like we have seen here with the conjunction, then we would have for all x it holds that x is a child and x loves ice cream, which means there are only kids in this universe of discourse and they love ice cream. So there is nobody else loving ice cream. So this is not allowed there, which means if we have here, for example, here, if x is not a child and nevertheless he or she loves ice cream, in the second variant, this would compute to zero. So this is not true, according to the logics behind there. And this is what we don't want to allow. Let's continue with the second case, with existential quantification. Again, let's look at the difference between the way how we expressed it here with a conjunction and if we would express it here with an implication. So we say here again, there are one or more interesting lectures, first by uh, there exists an x for, for x for which it holds that x is a lecture and x is interesting. So this means if x is a lecture, here last row, and x is interesting, and then here the blue result we see this computes to 1. That would be great. It would also hold true for the implication. However, the implication, as we know, also holds for true in the case, you know, if the first part here is negative, which means then there would be then also other things that are interesting besides lectures. But this is for our universe of discourse here, not of concern. So this should not compute one here. This is only, you know, X is only interesting if X is a lecture. So uh, it should really only be the last row here to be true. This is what we want to express here. So we have X and X is an interesting lecture. Okay, so much for the difference that you know or have seen how exactly these uh, implications or these quantifiers have effects on exactly the, the operators that we have here. Let's continue with the model theoretic semantics. So what we else need to 
uh, interpret exactly these first order logic formulas, we need of course a domain. So we have to define a domain over which we are talking about. And then of course when we have the domain, um, our constant symbols have to be mapped to elements of our domain, our function symbols have to be mapped to our domain, and also the relation symbols have to be mapped to our domain. What happens then is of course all of the terms that we have defined automatically will become elements of our domain D. And then also the relation symbols with arguments that we have over that domain, they will immediately become true or false. false. And then we treat the logical connectives and the quantifiers alike and in the end then we have then or we come to the result of the interpretation. So this was a crash course in model theoretic semantics in first order logic. Let's come to a practical example. Now this is my favorite example. After the ice creams, we have a penguin who says penguins are black and white. Some old TV shows are black and white. Therefore, some penguins are old TV shows. Isn't that obvious? Not to me. <laughs> okay, so let's see how we can formulate, formulate this um, through the use of first order logic so that it is computable automatically. We define this statement to be statement to be formula F. And um, we take the first sentence first. Penguins are black and white. Here we are talking about all penguins, so we can use the universal quantifier. For all x's, if x is a penguin, then x is black and white. That is our formula for the first sentence. Now let's look at the second sentence. Some old TV shows are black and white. Here we're not talking about all, but we're talking about some. So let's use the existential qu quantifier here. For x, for some x's, if x is an old TV show, x is black and white. And the last sentence, which, is, um, which comes after the implication here, because we have therefore, some penguins are old TV shows. Again, the existential quantifier, and for x, for some x's, if x is a penguin, x is an old TV show. Now we can combine all these three sentences and say, penguins are, are black and white, and some old TV shows are black and white. This implies that some penguins are old TV shows. Now, is this true? We can actually compute whether it's true or not. So let's see how this works. We have to define an interpretation i, and of course we are setting here up the domain, so a is a set m and contains the elements a and b. So we have no constants and no function symbols, that makes life of course much easier. And now what we want to do is we want to show, so because it, it sounds strange, doesn't it? So we want to show that this formula really is not a tautology, so it's not true under every circumstances, so there is let's say, an interpretation under which this formula is refutable or is unsatisfiable, uh, it's not satisfiable. Okay, how do we do that? We did this or we tried out something for you. We said, okay, if, you know, penguin A here is true and A also is black and white, it's also true, and B is an old TV show and B is also black and white. If all of those are true and we say A, is not an old TV show, then of course if we put this together to the formula you see up there, this would compute false. And this would be an interpretation, so we interpret uh, of course then our formula based on the elements we have here defined in the domain uh, in a way that is of course allowed. So simply we say, uh, we, we give the predicates that we have here the term specific truth values and under these conditions the formula then computes a false value so and therefore it's refutable. So the formula F with our given interpretation I is false and it follows that of course F is not a model of I. And in that sense, of course, um, yeah, it's not a tautology and we have to say goodbye to our penguins and to our TV shows because they don't come together in that way. Okay, we almost have it so far. Let's have a look now at logical entailment. So the last thing we will talk about in this lecture, we have to define what a theory is. So a theory T, that's quite simple. That's a set of formulas. You call that a theory. And an interpretation I is a model of T, of a theory, 
if and only if g can be deduced from i. So, or if i entails g for all formulas g in t. Which means a formula f is a logical consequence of t if and only if all models of t are also models of f. And then, of course, we write that t, the theory, entails also our formula f. And the rest that we need is, of course, the logical equivalence. Two formulas f and g are called logically equivalent if and only if the formula f entails the formula g and the formula g vice versa entails the formula f. Then f and g are equivalent. And that's our first order logic. Quick tour, but of course it's rather powerful, as we will see. Okay, now what we do then next, of course, is we will talk about ontologies. And we will see that none of these two logics that we have just now talked about, neither propositional logic nor first order logic, are capable to fulfill all our requirements because the one is too less or not powerful enough and the other one is of course way too powerful and not really quite handy if, if it comes to complicated expressions and complexibility, uh, sorry, complexity and computability. Simply for that reason we will define another logic which is called description logic, so it's a family of logics that is better suited for the representation of knowledge and you will see how to do that in the next lecture.